Okay. Yeah. Recording? Yes, you are online. Or <laughs> what is online? First of all, I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of my Diksen, Shikshu Guru, Nikhilid, of Krishna Om, Vishnu Pada, Pratapati, Yuan, Shila Ethi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. Then I offer my obeisances unto the lotus feet of my Shikshan Sanyaskuda, Nikhilid, of Krishna Om, Vishnu Pada, Pratapati, Yuan, Shila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Then I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of the, uh, my Shiksha Guru, Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj, and Srila Bhakti Bhagavan Maharaj. I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of Sri Rupa Nuga Guru Bhargava, Srila Bhakti Bhagavan Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Gosami Thakur, Srila Bhakti Bhagavan Thakur, and Srila Bhakti I offer my humble obeisances unto all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis who are present here today, my Nanavat and Nanavat Pranam. So, yesterday we did chapters 1 through 6. Okay. Today we're going to skip over and we'll do the, the lid. Okay, we did, we did the box. <laughs> Now we're going to do the lid, chapter 16, 13 through uh, 18, okay? There's a little bit of a setup here, we want to set this up. In the 12th chapter, which we're going to talk about on the last day, but in the 12th chapter, Krishna talks about Rag Bhakti and Vaidhi Bhakti and Sangha Siddha Bhakti, Rosh Siddha Bhakti, like this, different forms of Bhakti. So, Rag Bhakti is really the only Bhakti which is performed spontaneously from your heart. Vaidhi bhakti is you're not you're you're not really doing it spontaneously, you're following rules. Some of the bhakti, Arupsiddha bhakti, all of this is you're you're following some kind of rules and regulations and making some offerings to Krishna and some internal desires for one cup. So, for those persons, you're going to have to interact with the world. You have to work with the world. You have to be in the world. Those who are spontaneous, well, they don't have a problem because Krishna is taking care of them. They're spontaneous devotees. Everything is resting in there in Krishna's hands. It's all being managed by Krishna. He's managing everything. He is for the Vaidhi Bhaktis as well, but the Vaidhi Bhaktis don't yet really recognize that. <laughs> so they have to work in the world. If you have to work in the world, then what does that mean? That means you have to understand how the world works. Otherwise, what will happen? How we function in the world with a job and so on. Not possible. This leads back to the ninth chapter, that verse, Akichet Sudaracho. In the purport, Prabhupada says there's two tracks. There's conditional activity uh, and, and your constitutional activity, I mean your, your bhakti. The activity you do with the jiva, the soul. But the conditional activity, he said that you know you have to do that in order to get along in the world. You have to follow those rules and regulations of worldly life. And 
the constitutional activities are those things that you do to serve Krishna. And you try to do them on the, the two tracks run parallel and they don't cause any in uncongenial activity. So um, how can you do that if you don't know how the world works? How will you be able to run on the two tracks, the constitutional activities of your soul with the conditional activities of society, of your body interacting with society? If you don't know how the world works, how will you be able to act within the world so that you don't create, you don't contaminate your consciousness? to maintain your spiritual consciousness. So, chapters 13 through 18 teach us this. They teach us how the world works. What is the nature of this world? And what is the nature of our body? And what is the nature of our soul? And what is the interaction of our soul and our consciousness with the body and with the world. It teaches us all these things. If we don't learn these things, then how can we expect to practice Krishna consciousness without contaminating our consciousness? Right? You follow this so far? We're going to start now with chapter 13. It's called Nature, the Enjoyer, and Consciousness. And this is a description okay, of Samkhya, of the, of the material nature, how it's structured, and what your, you know, what your relationship with the material nature is. The, the gross elements. And the 14 chapter is going to talk about the modes of nature how we interact with the modes of nature. And then the 15th chapter is going to talk about how this world is a perverted reflection. It's an, it's a, it's an illusion. It's, an, it's, a, it's a mirror image, a shadow. You can see the shadow, but you can't touch it. It's there, but it's not there. <laughs> The 16th chapter is about the nature of association, the divine and the demoniac. If you're going to live in the world, you have to know who's behaving divinely and who's a demon and how to associate with the divine and how to avoid the demon. And the 17th chapter teaches us how to perform activities according to the mode of nature. Charity, austerity, sacrifices. How do we how do we do them in the mode of goodness which keeps us next to Bhakti as opposed to doing them in passion or ignorance? So these chapters are very important because they're teaching us how the world works. Most of us. 99% of the devotees have to work in the world. <laughs> and even those who are, you know, sannyasis or renunciates and they're, you know, spending most of their time doing bhajan or whatever, you know, studying or writing or whatever, but they still have to interact with the world, to travel, to preach, etc., etc. So they're also interacting with the world. We should understand the world, how it works. All right. So, chapter 18. Huh? 18 is the overview, conclusion and the overview. Huh? Conclusion and the overview. All right. So, nature and the enjoyer and consciousness. So, Arjun is asking one of his famous 16 questions. Where are the 16 questions? Who remembers? Where does Guru Dave give you a call? 254. I'm going to 
pop a little test on you like that. <laughs> Arjuna Ugacha, my dear Krishna, I wish to know about Prakriti, nature. He's asking me about five things. First thing is Prakriti, nature, the material nature. He wants to know about the material nature. Purusha, the enjoyer. And Kshetra and Kshetragna, the field and the knower of the field. And Jnanam, knowledge. And the end of Jnanam, Gnayam Jakesha, knowledge. And the end of knowledge. first verse. So the Blessed Lord said, this body of son of Kunti is the field, it's the shape of it. And one who knows this body is called the knower of the field. Shetragna, one who knows the field. Krishna immediately answers him in the second verse. <coughs> There's, there's this, uh, cassette tape recording. I was, uh, 25, 24, 25, I was 25. I was in Delhi, no problem. It's a room conversation. Prabhupada says, how will we preach? What will we give them? Different devotees are saying different things. So we have to give them knowledge. What is the difference between matter and spirit and control of both? Oh, what is that knowledge? And I started quoting all these verses from memory and explaining them word by word. And Prabhupada just kept saying, and, and. And then I finished explaining everything. He liked the fact that I knew the verses and the word for word, and I could explain it. He liked it. He wanted us to preach with that kind of authority. Now I'm old, I can't remember all the <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was 25. You have to bring him with you. <laughs> when I was 25, I remember. Shetra Gnam Chapiman Vidhi. Sara Shetra Shu Tara Shetra Shetra Nayur Gyanam Yatta Gyanam Matam Mama O sign of Bharat Krishna is addressing Arjuna You should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies and to understand this body and its owner is called knowledge So this Prabhupada always used to say Understanding the difference between matter and spirit, the control of both is knowledge, and this is where he gets it from, this verse. It's very important to understand. He's setting us up here, because he's going to talk more later on about himself as a super soul. But he's setting us up here, he's saying, you should, uh, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies. The jiva knows his particular field, his particular body. The atma, me, the atma inside this body knows this body. But I don't know your body. I don't know your body. I don't know your body. But what pains you're feeling, what the happiness you're feeling, what the stress you're feeling, I don't know. I know mine, but I don't know yours. So I'm the Shetra Gna, Gna, knowledge of the Shetra, I know my field. And your Shetra Gna, you know your field. And Krishna is the Param Shetra Gna. He knows all the fields. Shetra Gna Yor, Shetra Shetra Gna Yor. I know all the fields, all bodies. And to understand this body and its owner, is called knowledge. That is my opinion. So now, 
Krishna is going to give us basic Sankhya. The five great elements, Krishna said. Huh? Panchu Mahabhutani. Mahabhutani means Mahabhut. Bhut. Bhut means the elements. Mahabhut, five great elements. Okay? Mahabhutani. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. Mahabhutani huh? Ahankara. False ego, the intelligence, the unmanifested, the ten senses, the mind. So here, he's talking about the subtle body, meaning the false ego, the intelligence, and the mind. And then he calls that the unmanifested. Uh, because it's not manifest before our vision in a regular way. And this subtle body or astral body makes up mm, is the core of it is the false ego. That false ego is what's deciding due to the influence of the modes of nature, we'll, we'll be talking about that. What kind of body, mind, senses, physical uh, it wants. So, you've heard stories about ghosts. Huh? A ghost means this astral body. The physical body dies. The astral body doesn't accept that the body is dead. There's a story about one woman here in India. Her name is Shanti Devi. And she remembers everything about her previous birth. That's Lubni Devi, a Brahmini in Mathura. And then she was born in Delhi. This is from the 1930s. So she remembers how she died and then transitioned into the next body to go inside the womb. She remembers the whole thing. So, yeah, you have to bring it around. You can't pass it over the top of the good man. So, she tells the story how the doctor came in and he was examining her body. She was like in her mid 20s, young 20s. And then he shook his head and he took the sheet and he put it over her face. She said she didn't understand what was going on. He said she kept chanting because she was a devotee of Krishna from the tour. So she said, I kept chanting Krishna, 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 oh, Krishna, 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 Krishna. He said, then the doctor came in, he removed the sheet and my husband and son were standing there. And they were crying. And I kept shouting out to them, but I'm here, I'm here, I'm not dead. Why, why are you crying? I'm still here. The subtle body was still in the gross body, but the gross body had stopped functioning. So again, they covered up her body with a sheet, you know, they wrap it, and then they carry it to the smashan for burning burning yet. So when they laid the body on the funeral parlor, they said, they're going to burn the body. That's it. I, I must be dead. I thought I was alive, but I must be dead. So I'll leave. So then she left. So this is why you have to have the cremation. This in the lower states of consciousness. We don't always understand that the body has died. This is why you have a ghost. They put the body in a box and they bury it and then the ghost is hovering around in the graveyard. Oh, what's going on? Or he's hovering around in the room in the house where he died. Because the 
this is where I live, my house. So you look at that, some people say, well, I saw, see the ghost, he's an old man. I see the ghost of a little girl. I see the ghost of a woman. Why? A hunkar. The false ego is holding on to the physical identity it was last connected to in the last physical body it was in. You understand? It's not letting go of that conception. Because it's not letting go of that conception, it's holding on to it. It's remaining fixed. Fixed in that. <coughs> and it's not, and therefore you see this entity hovering around in a particular form. But uh, don't they get a new body? It takes time sometimes. It takes time. It's karma. Part of their karma sometimes it takes time for them to get the new body. It doesn't get, they don't all, always get it right away. That's part of the karma. When they die on natural death. Whatever is the reason, the karma for it, the story of the soul survival. The kid who died when he was 21 or 22 years old in the Iwo Jima in the battle. So then he takes birth again in 2000, the year 2000, 2002. He died in 44. He took birth in 2000, almost you know, 60 years later. He probably would have lived that long. So the subtle body was hanging around waiting for the next physical body. Because he died in unnatural death and plane. Then he takes birth, the next body. So, and that, that's how I, I don't want to get too far off track. It's a whole other, I can talk for two hours about that. I'm not going to get that far. Anyway, I'm talking about it now because Krishna is talking about the structure of the living entity and of the universe. So he's saying, you have five great elements and the false ego, the intelligence and the mind, the unmanifested, the ten senses, the five sense objects, desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms, and convictions, all these are considered in summary to be the field of activities and its interaction. He's describing Prakriti, nature. Okay? And there, you know, I could explain all the details when you talk about the five great elements, earth, water, fire, ether, okay? So then you talk about the ten senses. So there's the working senses and there's the other senses. So there's eyes, okay, ears, nose, mouth, okay? These are, I mean, uh, yeah, and that's working senses and anus, okay? okay? You have working senses and then you have the sense, you have the sense of seeing, you have the sense of hearing, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, and the sense of touch. Okay. And then for each one of the senses, you have a working sense. Okay. So for the sense of hearing, there's the voice box because that creates the sense of the ear. And then there's also the ear. So then you have, for the sense of sight, uh, the sense of touch, you have the, the, the hand, uh, the, the feet. The feet for walking and, uh, and the skin, the skin for feet. And then for the eyes, the eyes you have uh, uh, vision and you have the eyes and you have the, the hand for grasping the things that you see. And then the water is the upper tongue and the lower tongue, okay? The same tongue because you taste the two pleasures, eating and sex. And then the anus, okay, has uh, connected to the nose and the sense of smell. Okay. So like this, you have 15 senses. The sense organ, the 
sense itself, and then the working sense. So there are different senses. So he's saying here, you have the ten senses and the five senses. So you have all these different senses. So he's describing all the things that are connected to the field, this body, and what you're interacting with. Now he describes things, <clears throat> humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, approaching the bona fide guru, cleanliness, steadiness, self-control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the perception of the evil of birth and death, old age and disease, non-attachment to children, to wife, to home and the rest, even mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, resorting to solitary places, detachment from the general mass of people, accepting the importance of self-realization, and the philosophical search for the absolute truth, all these I thus declare to be knowledge. And what is contrary to these is ignorance. So Arjuna asks, I want to know what is the field, the knower of the field, what is knowledge and the end of knowledge. So here Krishna is describing knowledge. Huh? Now he begins to describe the super soul. From verse 13 onwards he's talking about how it's everywhere, it's hands and legs are everywhere, it's manifest, it's unmanifest, it's in one place, but it's in many places at the same time. And he's describing all about the super soul. Then, he says, nature is said to be the cause of all material activities and effects, whereas the living entity is the cause of the various sufferings and enjoyments in the world. All the material activities and effects uh, are caused by the modes of material nature. But the living entity, by its desire, is the one who's creating the happiness and distress. The living entity in the material nature thus follows the ways of life enjoying the three modes of material nature. This is due to his association with that material nature. Thus he meets with good and evil amongst various species. Yet in this body there is another a transcendental enjoyer who is the Lord. So he's described how the jiva is the enjoyer within the material body. Now he's describing how besides, you know, because he already mentioned, I'm the knower of all bodies. You know your body, but I'm the knower of all bodies. Now he's saying, in this body, and he's, he's emphasizing this because he's wants to emphasize what the relationship is of the super soul with the jiva and the physical body. So he says a, tr a transcendental enjoyer who is the Lord. He's the other person in this body. He is the param purusha. Dehi smin purusha para. Who is the param purusha in the dehi? It's the Lord, super soul, Krishna. He's the param purusha. And what is his activity? He exists within the body for one purpose. Upadrashta and Anumanda. Drashta means to see. Upadrashta, the overseer. I'm seeing what you want. You want money? You want boys? You want girls? You want this? You want that? What do you want? What is it you want? Fame? Which opulence of mind? Fame, power, money, <laughs> beauty. Renunciation. Which of my opulences do you want? And to what degree do you want it? Krishna. I'm overseeing that. And then based on your activities, I will permit. Okay. You can have. You can have this much opulence, this much beauty, fame, power, knowledge, whatever it is you want. Ya evam vetti purusham prakritim chaguna saha sarvata vartmano pi nasa buya bhijayate 
one who understands this philosophy concerning material nature, the living entity, and the interaction of the modes of nature is sure to attain liberation. He will not take birth here in this material world again, regardless of his present position. But when you understand this, this, this information, this knowledge, you can become liberated from this material world. The sky, due to its subtle nature, does not mix with anything, although it is all pervading. Similarly, the soul, situated in Brahman vision, does not mix with the body, though situated in that body. For son of Bharat, as the sun alone illuminates all this universe, so does the living entity, one within the body, illuminate the entire body by consciousness. So here, Krishna is making a point to show you that the consciousness is separate thing. It's connected to the soul. The subtle body, uh, he talked about it earlier, he says there's the Pancha Mahabhut, the five great elements, and then there's the mind, intelligence, and false ego, subtle material elements. But the soul is separate. The soul is separate. The soul is within that subtle body. The soul goes all over. Esho Anuratma, Esho Anuratma, the Atma is floating on the airs. Is it the Atma itself that's floating on the air? No, it's the consciousness. Here. Just as the sun illuminates all this universe, so does the living entity, one within the body, illuminate the entire subtle and gross body with consciousness. Consciousness is like sunshine. It spreads all over the subtle body. And it expands beyond the subtle body and beyond the gross body, and you can see it as what's called the aura. <coughs> the soul, and we're going to talk about this in the next couple of chapters, the soul doesn't become contaminated. It's the consciousness that becomes influenced by the modes of nature, not the soul. Just like the sun is here in the sky, and now there's clouds or pollution in the air. What are the clouds and pollution influencing? They're influencing the sunshine. They're not touching the sun. But when the sunshine is covered with the clouds and pollution, you, you can't see the sun. But when the consciousness is covered, with the modes of material nature, you can't see yourself, who you are. You can't be self-realized. Okay. Confirmed. <laughs> Just like so. So, Prabhupada, in the purport, there are various theories regarding consciousness. Here in Bhagavad Gita, the example is given of the sun and the sunshine. As the sun is situated in one place but is illuminating the whole universe, so a small particle of spirit soul, though situated in the heart of this body, is illuminating the whole body by consciousness. Thus consciousness is the proof of the presence of the soul, as sunshine or light is the proof of the presence of the sun. Prabhupada gives us this information so we can understand. One who knowingly sees the difference between the body and the owner of the body and can understand the process of liberation from this bondage also attains to the Supreme Court. 
So this is the end of chapter 13, Nature of the Enjoyer and Consciousness. Huh? Now, we go to chapter 14. Another one of our Junas, actually, uh, the lore begins right away. Again, I shall declare to you the supreme wisdom, the best of all knowledge, knowing which all the sages have attained the supreme perfection. By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain to the transcendental nature, which is like my own nature. Thus established, one is not born at the time of creation, nor disturbed at the time of dissolution. The total material substance is called Brahman, is the source of birth, and it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making it possible Births of all living beings, both son of Bart. Who read yesterday? I told you about a verse in the fourth chapter. Remember? Ah, Brahmarpanam. Yes. Fourth chapter, twenty-fourth verse, and the purport. Prabhupada talks about this in the purport that everything is Brahman. Material nature is Brahman, and the process of Krishna consciousness is transforming everything back into Brahman. Do you follow? The veil of illusion makes you think that this is a material table. The Prabhupada said once it's engaged in Krishna's service, it becomes Brahman, spiritualized just like the body of the pure devotee. It appears to be made of mundane elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. It appears to be made of blood and muscle and bone and fat. It appears like that to our untrained eye. But the body of the pure devotee is Chinmaya Sarir. It is a Sarir, a body which is Chinmaya, transcendental touchstone, spiritual. What is the proof? When Srila Prabhupada and Srila Gurudev left this world, their bodies did not exhibit any of the mundane characteristics of a material body. All of their limbs were flaccid. They had no rigor mortis whatsoever. No mottling. The blood did not seep out of the veins and collect clots. There's no black and blues, no mottling. In fact, Prabhupada and Gurudev were effulgent. There was no bad odor. They both smelled very beautiful, very fragrant. No, no gangrene anywhere. They didn't deteriorate. How can they deteriorate when they're transcendental beings? You understand? So it is transformed. The process of prashadam is a transformation. You take earth, water, fire, air, and ether. You prepare it with a certain consciousness and you offer it in front of the deity. And this is the example he gives in the fourth chapter. He says, therefore, uh, the, the, uh, object to whom you're offering. Who is the object to whom we're offering? The deity. What we are offering? The boga. The process of the offering. The ceremony. The offerer, the pujari, all together constitute Brahman. Therefore, it goes in as rice and it comes out as prashad. Why is it prashad? Because it has been touched by the mouth of Krishna due to the process of offering being, have it being offered with love. you follow? So, 
Krishna is saying the total material substance called Brahman is the source of birth and it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making possible the birth of all living entities. Sarvayoneshu kamteya murtaya sambhavantiya tasman brahman mahadyo dear. Aham bija pradhati. I am the seed giving father. It should be understood that all species of life, O son of Kunti, are made possible by birth. by birth in this material nature and that I am the seed giving father. Material nature consists of the three modes of passion and ignorance, goodness, passion and ignorance. When the living entity comes in contact with nature, he becomes conditioned by these modes. What is becoming conditioned? Is it the jiva himself? No, it's the consciousness. The consciousness is becoming conditioned. And when you remove the modes of nature uh, and you attain some bhakti sukriti, impressions of bhakti on your consciousness, that stays with your consciousness as your subtle body, which we'll see in the next chapter, is carrying to the next gross body. Uh. O oh, sinless one, the mode of goodness being purer than the others is illuminating. It frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode develop knowledge, but they can, be, can become conditioned by the concept of happiness. Because when one has so much knowledge, they think, oh, I know everything. <laughs> so, since I know all these things, I know what's going on. Sometimes you see scientists are like this. Yes, yes, that's happening because Bob. And yeah, 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 that's happening. Yeah, I have knowledge. I know why everything is happening. Therefore, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Because I know why it's going on. I know what's going on. That sense of happiness is false. Because in one minute, everything can be over and you have no explanation. The boat man. Huh? The boat man. The boat man, yeah. <laughs> you have <coughs> all this knowledge, but you don't know how to swim. <laughs> the mode of passion is born of unlimited desires and longings, O son of Kunti, and because of this, one is bound to material fruit of activity. Like in the stock market, uh, in business, in corporations, more money, more of everything. We have to have more, we need more money. Why most of the world's wealth is in the hands of a few hundred people? More, 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 we need more. We don't have enough yet, everything. We want the money and we want the water and we want the oil and we want, we want everything. You can't have anything, you just buy it. will be described in a couple of chapters now. It's 16. Uh, unlimited desire. There's no end to the desire for more. O son of Bartha, the mode of ignorance causes delusion of all living entities. The result of this mode is madness, indolence, and sleep, which bind the conditioned soul. So, becoming ignorant of the world because it's it's too much they don't have the passion to live life and they don't have the goodness to try and make a better life uh, to do something of value to society or whatever therefore they fall into madness indolence and sleep the mode of goodness conditions one to happiness passion conditions into the fruits of action and ignorance to madness. When one dies in the mode of goodness, he attains the pure higher planets. And when one dies in the mode of passion, he takes birth among those engaged in fruit of activities. And when he dies in the mode of ignorance, he takes birth in the animal kingdom. I remember when I was a young brahmachari in New Orleans. I'd been in the movement about a year. We used 
used to do Kirtan and book distribution, magazine distribution and incense in the park, in the French Quarter. Sure. And there was a woman. I, I never forget this woman. I mean, this was 45 years ago, but I can't forget it. And she was homeless. And she used to lie on the bench in the park. But I mean, she lied with the two hands like this and the two legs behind her. I mean, she was already taking the posture of a cat. Lying on the bench. And when she talks, she knows to talk like this. I was so frightened. Because I understood from reading the Gita what was going to happen. So every day I would come and I would bring Krishna and say, please eat this Prashadam. <laughs> and I'd make sure that we would chant right next to her so that somehow <laughs> she would hear the chanting and get the benefit, you know, and not, not take birth as a cat. I was so worried that she was going to be a cat. Or a cat. So, and I never forgot that woman. I wish I could remember her, you know, 45 years later. I still remember. Huh? She was the first body, human body, she was under the cat. I mean, you know, I hope, I pray that she's, you know, that she's got a better birth and that she must be dead by now. I mean, she had no life. She was an old woman. So, you know, this happens. People say that you can't go down again and take birth in the animal kingdom, but you can. You come back, Tirtha Maharaj was telling me that he met somebody one time who, uh, in a village, who remembered being a cow. He, he remembered being a human and then dying and becoming a cow and then becoming a human again. He remembered the whole sequence. And he he told me, he said, I was in that family in that village over there and I was thinking of my cow when I died and then I took birth as a cow in that other village over there and he, had, he knew the whole, you know, what had happened, you know. And how he, it would happen, it would happen. From the mode of goodness, real knowledge develops. From the mode of passion, grief develops. And from the mode of ignorance, foolishness, madness, and illusion develop. The mode of passion, we think that we're gaining something, you know. I got a bigger house, I got a bigger car, I have more cars. You know, I was reading the story about this one famous comedian. He's got a, he bought an airline hangar at, an air, at a closed down airstrip. He bought the hangar and the airstrip. So he could put is 150 antique cars inside the thing. And he goes to the, goes to the hangar, he takes out one of the cars and drives it up and down the strip and then puts it back. That's what he does. Next day, he takes another one. Huh? Next day, he takes a different one. Yeah, you know, just, just like, a, like, you know, a child having like a box full of little cars and playing with them on the ground. You know, he's got big cars because he's a multimillionaire. You know, wasting human life. Wasting human life. There's people with no houses, no cars, no life. And he's got 100, 150 cars with an airline hangar and airstrip. It doesn't make any sense. So, in the end, he'll have to suffer. He's got happiness now, but in the end, he'll have to suffer. He'll have to suffer grief. Grief will come. Something will happen. You may have so much money, power, strength, whatever you may have, but grief will come. I remember in London, there was one woman. 
she had the kind of beauty that would stop a room. She'd walk in a room and it didn't matter who you were, how many years you've been celibate, whatever. You had to look at this woman. She had that kind of beauty. It was stunning beyond you know, stop a room. Everyone had a look when she walked in. And she was very proud of it. Beautiful. One day she was in the kitchen. The sari caught fire and it covered her face and her whole face became burned. And they couldn't fix it again. They could never make it back to what it was. So the mode of passion. If you are passionate about the opulences that you have obtained from Krishna then grief will develop. And she was so grief-stricken after this, how her stunning beauty was removed in one shot. Those situated in the mode of goodness gradually go upward to the higher planets. Those in the mode of passion live on the earthly planets. And those in the mode of ignorance go down to the hellish world. When you see that there is nothing beyond these modes of nature and all activities and that the Supreme Lord is transcendental of all these modes, then you can know my spiritual nature. When the embodied being is able to transcend these three modes, he can become free from birth, death, old age, and their distresses and can enjoy nectar even in this life. So we see uh, how uh, having knowledge of the three modes of material nature, yeah. having knowledge of the three modes of material nature and how they interact with the physical body uh, and the consciousness, okay, and the subtle body, that one can transcend the material nature. Now Arjuna asks another of his famous questions. Instead of at the beginning of the chapter, it comes in the middle. Oh, my dear Lord, by what symptoms is one <coughs> known who is transcendental to these modes? What is his behavior? And how does he transcend the modes of nature? The Blessed Lord said, He who does not hate illumination, attachment, and delusion when they are present, nor longs for them when they disappear, who is seated like one unconcerned, being situated beyond these material reactions of the modes of nature, who remains firm, knowing that the modes alone are active, who regards the light pleasure and pain, and looks on a clod, a stone, and a piece of gold with an equal eye, who is wise and holds praise and blame to be the same, who is unchanged in honor and dishonor, who treats friends and foe alike who has abandoned all fruit of undertakings, such a man is said to have transcended the modes of nature. So here gives a very beautiful explanation of all the qualities that one has who has transcended the modes of nature and who has attained to the modes of goodness and beyond the mode of goodness who is actually tasting spiritual Manchayoga Picharena Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunana Samatikyaitam Brahma Bhuyaitamate. One who engages in full devotional service, who does not fall down in any circumstance, at once transcends the mode of material nature, and thus comes to the level of Brahma. Brahmano hi pratishta aham. Prabhupada used to use this was a core verse that Prabhupada used in his argument against the Mayavadi. Brahmano he the I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman. It rests on me. Pratishtaham. It rests on me. Amritasya vivyasya cha shashvatasya chadarmasya sukhasyae kantikasya cha. Which is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness and which is immortal, imperishable. 
that's the, the ending of the 14th chapter. So, this chapter on the modes of material nature gives us an understanding of how we're influenced. We got a, a snapshot of that in the third chapter of the Gita, Prakriti Kriyamana Nibunai Karmani Sarvasa, the, the, the living entity is body is forced by the modes of material nature to act in a certain way. But here, we're getting more details about how the modes of material nature force the consciousness to act, which then forces the body to act in a certain way. And how to transcend it. How to transcend it? Krishna says, you should not hate illumination, attachment, and delusion when they are present nor long for them when they disappear. Like this, he gives an explanation of how to be in the proper consciousness. All right, now we come to the 15th chapter, Yoga of the Supreme Person. Urdhva Malam Adashaka, upside down tree. Urdhva Mulam, Urdhva means up, Mulam means roots, down. Ada means down. Shaka means branches. The branches are down and the roots are up. Upside down tree. How the tree is upside down. Can we see an upside down tree anywhere? Have you seen? Have you seen upside down tree? Yes. <laughs> I'm asking her. <laughs> no, her, her. Yes. Mm. Has she seen upside down tree? Huh? Reflection. Reflection, yes. By the lake. If you're next to the lake, and you look at the lake, then it looks like the roots are up, and the branches are down. Reflection. Well, this means two things. This world is a reflection means that somewhere there's a real world. Just like there's a real tree that's in the proper position. Somewhere there's a real world. And this is only a reflection of that real world. There is a banyan tree which has its roots upwards and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. One who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. The branches of this tree extend downward and upward nourished by the three modes of material nature. In other words, this is the mundane world. It's not transcendental world. It is the mundane world. It's nourished by the modes of nature and the Vedic hymns for material pleasure, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. The twigs are the objects of the senses. The tree is also has roots going down and these are bound to the fruit of actions of human society. The real form of this tree cannot be perceived in this world. We cannot see it. It is very complex. No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is. But with determination, one must cut down this tree with the weapon of? What weapon? Knowledge. Detachment. Detachment. So doing, so doing, one must seek that place from which, having once gone, one never returned. One must seek that place from which, having once gone, one never returns to this world. And there, surrender to that Supreme Personality of Godhead from whom everything has begun and in everything is abiding since time immemorial. Na tad basyate suryo na shasham kor na pavaka yad gatva na nirvatante tad dama paramamama That abode of mind is not illuminated by the sun or moon nor by electricity and one who reaches it never returns to this material world. If when we go there we never return, then how is it possible that we fell from there? Not possible. This is 
some confusion. <laughs> we fell from the locus. Now the new, they've come up with a new twist on this. They say, they, they, there's some conversation with Prabhupada that actually we haven't fallen. We're just, we think we fell. We're in this dream. So they say, see, actually what's going on is our original spiritual form, our soul, is in Goloka now. And we, our consciousness, we're, we're dreaming that we're in this world, but we're not actually here. So like their idea is that somewhere in Goloka there's this big field of people who are sleeping in the bed. <laughs> it's like my other Yeah. It's like complete confusion, you know. So I pointed out that verse that I showed before, the 13th chapter, that where Brahma says there's the soul in the body and the consciousness extending from the body, that the soul is inside the body and the consciousness illuminates the body. So I say, how can you say the consciousness is here and the soul is up there when he's saying in the Gita that the soul is inside the body illuminating the body with consciousness? No, you're only dreaming that. Make another sleeping pill because... <laughs> 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 they're dreaming, but they are in the Yeah, they're dreaming. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Then one very famous verse, Mamai Bamso Jiva Loke Jiva Sanatana. Mana Shastrani Indriyani Prakriti Stani Karshati. They're struggling very hard with the six senses, which include the mind, due to this condition of life, Mana Shastrani Indriyani. The living entities, Mamai Bamso Jiva Loke. They are my eternal fragmental parts. Prabhupada also uses this verse. Just like he uses that other one, Brahmano He Pratishna Hum, that Krishna is the foundation of the Brahman. He uses this verse to prove that the jivas are all tiny individual parts and parcels of Krishna. Bamai Vam So Jiva Loke. They we the jivas are my eternal. Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Sanatana means eternal. There's no beginning and no end to it. We are always the fragmental part of Krishna. But we are presently bound up in this material nature. Sri Yaratno Ti Yachchat Yudkram Utkramatishvara Greek Vaitani Samyati Vayur Gandham Nivasha. Vayur means air. Ganga means fragrance. <laughs> the fragrance is traveling on the air. You light the incense over there. You're sitting here. But the fragrance is coming from there to your nose. Similarly, the jiva, the living entity in the material world, carries his different conceptions of life. Where does he carry the material conception? In the subtle body, in the astral body in the ahankara, in the mind. He carries the subtle material conceptions in the astral body. And where does he carry the spiritual conception? In the consciousness. Remember, there's two things. The consciousness is eternal, so the, and bhakti is eternal. So bhakti impressions will stay on the eternal consciousness. And the subtle <laughs> material desires, huh? conception, from one body to another as the air carries aroma. The living entity thus taking another gross body obtains a certain type of ear, tongue, and nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped around the mind. He thus enjoys a particular type of sense object. Huh? So, we carry the conceptions with us. Right? In the morning, we look in the mirror. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm too pale. I'm too dark. I'm too this. I'm too that. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. I wish I had this. I wish I 
Right? Unlimited desire. We want. Isn't it? I want, I want, I want. Carry those conceptions with us. And then, Upadrashtaru Mantachara. Super soul is overseeing and permitting. Okay, you've done enough in this life. So you can get this very stunning body that you want, so when you walk in the room, you stop everybody. Okay, you've had it for 24 years. Now I'm taking it away because you have done some other. So now fire comes and your face gets like this. Another important verse in this chapter. Sarva Sicha Hamri Dizavi Stomata Sarkir Ganamapo and Amcha. Vinais Chasavir Hamme Vabid Yo Vidanta Kris Beda Vidya Cha. Prabhupada also uses this verse many times when he's preaching. Sarva Sicha Hamri Dizavi Sto. I am seated in everyone's heart. Vidhi. Vidhi means heart. Chaham. Sarvasya Chaham. Everyone's heart. I am seated. Shadivishtu. Mata Smirter Gyanam. Apohanam. I am giving. Remembrance. I am giving Gyanam, knowledge, and Apohanam. Forgetfulness. You want to forget me? I can help you to forget me also if you want to. <laughs> want Maya and you want to forget me then I will make very nice Maya for you and forget me what do you want? Vedais Cha Saver Aham Eva Vedya by all the Vedas Vedais Cha Saver I am to be known indeed Vedanta Krit Veda Ved I am the compiler of the Vedas, I am the knower of the Vedas, and by all the Vedas, I am to be known. Because I am transcendental beyond both the fallible and the infallible, and because I am the greatest, I am celebrated both in the world and in the Vedas as that Supreme Person. Whoever knows me is the Supreme Personality of Godhead without doubting is to be understood as the knower of everything and he therefore engages himself in the full devotional service O son of Lord. this is the most confidential part of Vedic scriptures O sinless one and it is disclosed now by me whoever understands this will become wise and his endeavors will know perfect 15 chapters. It's 5 after 6. I'm going to try and finish this in the next 10 minutes, just quickly. We're now talking about the divine and demoniac natures. We've covered what is Prakriti, the nature of the world. What is the modes of nature? How we interact with them. Please pay attention. Others are trying to listen all. I know you're talking about the verse. Okay. And then we talked about the perverted reflection of the material world, how the world is simply a shadow of the real spiritual world. Now we're talking about association. Because ultimately, spiritual life is about association. Who are we going to associate with? And so here he's giving the list who are the divine and who are the demonic. 16 chapters. Those who are fearless, purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Vedas, austerity, simplicity, non-violence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault finding, compassion, freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, and steady determination, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, 
cleanliness, freedom from envy, and the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities of Son of Bharata belong to the godly men endowed with the divine nature. This is verse 1, okay? Through 3, 1 through 3 of the 16th chapter. Arrogance, pride, anger, conceit, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of demoniac nature. The transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with divine qualities. Some people are born with divine, and some people are born with demoniac. But the power of bhakti is such that it can transform a demoniac person into a devotee. This is the whole reason for the Jagai and Madai and Lila. That by bad association, they were born into Brahmin family, but they became demoniac. Then by good association and the mercy of Sadhu, they became again divine. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest amongst men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence and to various demoniac species of life. Attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, such persons can never approach me. Gradually they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. They once asked Prabhupada about the man, what is his name? Ray Kroc, the one who started the McDonald's. They asked him, what happens to his soul? Prabhupada said he has to go back to the beginning of the 8 million 400,000 years. Yeah, go through the whole thing again. Good. Start all over. You have to go. I'm getting late. A few more minutes. There are three gates leading to hell. What are the three gates leading to hell? Who knows? Anger. Anger. Lust. Lust. Greed. Greed. Mom, bro, bro. I know that. Three gates leading to hell. Lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up. They lead to the degradation of the soul. The man who has escaped these three gates of hell, O son, is going to be performed to acts conducive to self-realization and thus graduate, attains the supreme destiny. All right, now, in the 17th chapter, it's called the vision of state. Arjuna, again, asks one of his famous questions. What is the situation of one who does not follow the principles of scripture but worships according to his own imagination? Is he in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? The Supreme Lord said, according to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be of three kinds, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Now hear about these. According to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. The living being is said to be of a particular kind of faith according to the modes he has acquired. Men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods, those in the mode of passion worship the demons, and those in the mode of ignorance worship ghosts and spirits. Those who undergo severe austerity and penances not recommended in the scripture perform them out of pride, egotism, lust, and attachment who are impelled by passion who torture their bodily organs as well as the super soul dwelling within are to be known as demons. Like some people you see, they fast for political reasons. Prabhupada said this is demoniac, this is evil, not spiritual. Even food, of which all partake is of three kinds according to the three modes of material nature, 
The same is true of sacrifices, austerity, and charity. Listen and I shall tell you of the distinctions of these three. So, <clears throat> what happens is, in this chapter, Krishna explains that charity is of three kinds. Charity in the mode of business, in the mode of passion, and the mode of It's according to appropriate behavior. To give you an example about charity. Say you give money to a man on the street who's a drunkard. So <coughs> you have given it at an inappropriate time to an inappropriate person in an inappropriate manner. And therefore the result is tamasa. Unbeneficial for him and for you. Say you want some recognition for the money you give. Huh? You put a big check. Goes in the newspaper. I gave a million dollars. Look at me. So this is passion. They want some recognition for who they are and what they've done. Huh? Then you have the mode of goodness. You see people like this, uh, people that come on car team, right? On the certain days of car team. So it's an appropriate time because it's a holy day and it's a holy month. And appropriate place, Govardhan, Vrindavan. And appropriate items, they give prasadam and they give cloth to the Brahmins and the Vaishnavas. And uh, in an appropriate manner, they follow the proper procedures for doing it. So all of this is something, huh? and this gets you uh, spiritual benefits. Okay? And of course, if you give something to a sadhu like Gurudeva Prabhupada, then this is Bhakti Supreme. It's beyond the three modes of material nature. But this is just an idea. You read this chapter, you see there's austerities and goodness, passion, and ignorance. There's sacrifices and goodness, passion, and ignorance. Food and goodness. Everything is divided. And what the idea of understanding this is so that you act. You're always supposed to act as much as possible, at least, in goodness. So that you're right next to transcendent. And then by the practice of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from the lips of the sadhu, then all the passion and ignorance is removed. You get established firmly in the modes of goodness and then transcendence as your anarchists are removed by hearing from the sadhu. So this is the process. This is the process. Now, I'm just going to read the first uh, two verses of the 18th chapter, which is called Conclusion, the Perfection of Renunciation. Arjuna said, O mighty armed one, I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation, yaga, and of the renounced order of life, sanyam, O killer of the Keshi demon, Rishikesh. The Supreme Lord said to give up the results of all activities is called renunciation by the wise. That state is called the renounced order of life, sannyas, by the great learned man. So throughout this chapter, again, Krishna talks about how to renounce, how to become detached from the world. And then ultimately, in verse 65, he gives the, the order. The order which he gave in the heart of the Gita, the last verse of the ninth chapter. Always think of me, huh? Yeah. Always think of me, always worship me. Always uh, do everything in the proper mood to serve me like this. So, this is the most important verse of the Gita. 9, 30, 35, 35, 9, 35, and 18, 65. Now, 1866, we talked about this the other day. When we were talking about 
Because Gurudev says, this means that Krishna is saying, surrender to me, Ashama Sundar. <laughs> he says it in the Govinda Leela Rita. That's in that book, Govinda Leela Govinda. What is it? Govinda Leela? Govinda. Nectar of Govinda Leela. Nectar in that book, he talks about it. So that's what that Gaudiya Sannyasi asks. Isn't this Dwarkadish? Who's speaking the Gita? Is it Dwarkadish or Shant? So then Gurudev explains to him how the three are simultaneously one and different. They're always together in Bone Lila. They're always present with each other. That's why Krishna is not killing the demons in the Loka, the Turish Dwarkadisha within Krishna. And Dwarkadish is not calling out Radhe Radhe Nam, Namdabhava against Sodomai and Dwarka in the beds of Rukmini and Santibhava. It's Sham who's inside so Therefore, on the chariot, at this particular moment, Gurudev is indicating Surrender unto me means Shamanam. Alright, so that's uh, these six chapters, Gyan Yoga. Uh, according to Vishnu Chakravati Thakura, learning about how the world works so that we Vaidhi Bhaktis and Rokhsada Bhaktis and Sangasada Bhaktis and Karma Vishra Bhaktis, we can interact with the world right? and still stay old from it and not let our constitutional activities conflict with our conditional activities. Right? Thank you very much, Vanchakalva Guruvis Chakravati and next week, I'll talk about the first three chapters of the middle of the Gita, 7, 8, 9. And then the week after, I'll talk about 10, and then 11 and 12. So two more questions in the class if we can get. Hare Krishna. Maras, can you close it? Yeah, you just close it. Yeah, and then... And then you do this.